liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? All right. Well, I don't know if we, we don't, we're trying not to just like jump into it, right? So <laughs> pretty much yeah. ease on into things. Okay. How are we going to do that? I don't know. Slide I, us on in there. <laughs> <laughs> on the, I used real nice in my glass tonight. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Um, you can thank uh, my brother and sister-in-law for that, by the way. That's that definitely a good purchase, man. Yeah. I love those things. It was a Christmas gift. Oh, when you had that in the refrigerator or in the freezer, I was like, ooh. Yeah, it doesn't work in the refrigerator. I tried it. <laughs> yeah, yeah not, no good there. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you can't ever get ice out of it that way. Oh, that's no good, man. Yeah. So I moved it to the freezer and it worked better. That was, that was a good call, man. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Live and learn, you know, <laughs> trial and error. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's enough of that. <laughs> uh, we'll jump into it now. Um, okay. So what I wanted, I actually wanted to start with a clip uh, tonight. This is um, William Barr, uh, who suggested that in order to combat China, and specifically Huawei is. I, I think we've talked about Huawei some on the podcast before. I think we have we'd... a little bit, but maybe just kind of let give because like before we talked about it on here, I had no clue who Huawei was. Like, I okay, mean... uh, Huawei is a Chinese uh, telecoms um, producer. Uh, they do uh, they do a bunch of um, um, wireless technology and uh, phones. Yeah, um, and as I understand it, they make really great phones. But you can't get them here <laughs> because our government thinks that the Huawei is a bunch of Chinese spies, and they're worried that our personal phone calls might be recorded and sent back to China. Um, and the NSA wants to make sure that they're the only people listening I to our phone calls. I was fixing to say, there's only one game in town as far as that's concerned here in the U.S. You right. Know, you Chinese can't be listening to us, too. Yeah. <laughs> just, just us. Exactly. <laughs> Frankly, I'm less concerned about the Chinese listening to my personal phone calls than my government, but Dude, I absolutely agree. I mean, there's far less I have far less to fear from the Chinese than I do people here. Mm -hmm. Government officials here at least. Yeah. So, um Barr, I, I'm not even sure like what this speech was supposed to be about, like why he was talking. Um mm -hmm. so I'll be honest, I didn't get it in context. I got this part of the of the speech where he's talking about what the US government might do. Um because the real problem is that the that Huawei is a is a world leader in 5G technology. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing that this speech had something to do with trade. I mean, that's really kind of just me making a guess, but he they had to have been having a conversation about trade and then bar came up with this <laughs> like uh if we make a trade deal with china will we take huawei's um help building 5g infrastructure that kind of something yeah. like that i mean i'm just taking a guess but yeah well they would be the logical choice because they've put a lot of work into it yeah um they, they are the world leader on in 5g tech yeah. uh, probably um and they certainly are the the biggest company with the capabilities to build out a 5G infrastructure. Yeah. And uh, the U.S. government has been working hard to convince our European allies and so forth not to accept uh, Huawei's help building out their 5G infrastructure, and we've absolutely... It, it is verboten here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so, so somebody's going to have to build our infrastructure. <laughs> right, and... And there's some U.S. options, but we'll we'll get to that later. Um, let's just uh, let's just jump right into the right into the clip. And other countries that do not want to put their economic fate in China's hands are not going to install Huawei's infrastructure. We have to have a market ready alternative today. You need a system that will allow you to seamlessly migrate your installed 4G base to your to 5G. There have been some proposals that these concerns could be met by the United States aligning itself with Nokia and or Ericsson through American ownership of a controlling stake, either directly or... Th okay, uh, what he's talking about there that, you know, we, we've got to... Um, <laughs> that in order to deal with Huawei and not use them because we're, we're scared for our security uh, to... Uh, for the U.S. to align itself with either Nokia or Ericsson, 
um, by the U.S. government taking a controlling stake, that's just communism. <laughs> Flat but, out, like, yeah, yeah, there's not really much question what that is. <laughs> yeah. So more on that in a minute. Uh, let's keep going. Through a consortium of private American and allied companies. All right. If you add uh, it, if you do it through a proxy of private American companies, yeah. that's fascism. <laughs> so these are our two options so far. Yeah. All right. Back into it. The main concern about these suppliers is that they have neither Huawei's scale nor the backing of a powerful country with a large embedded market like China. Putting our large market and financial muscle behind one, one or both of these firms would make it a far more formidable competitor and eliminate concerns over its staying power or their staying power. We and our closest allies certainly need to be actively considering this approach. Okay, and that's the, that's the end of his talk. Um, or at least the, the part that I pulled anyway. Uh, so here's the problem. This is one of those things is th- about government involvement in the market anyway. This is part of the reason that we, we are opposed to government in the market. We want real free enterprise. Is that this is a case where a government is very clearly picking a winner in the market. So, okay, we're concerned that, uh, that China supports their big company, Huawei, and so what we're going to do instead is to support um, either the, the Finnish uh, Nokia or Ericsson, which is a Swedish company, yeah. All right, um, in order to give them the kind of support that they need to compete with Huawei on the world stage. Take note that that's using taxpayer money to do this. By <laughs> using the way, our money. By yeah. the way, but what about uh, what about Qualcomm? Qualcomm yeah. is a five G uh, technology provider. That's a U.S. company. Yeah. Or um, if you're moving away from that a little bit, uh, what about Samsung? Um, Samsung is another five G um, technology producer. Uh, they're South Korean. Uh, South Korea is at least an ally. I don't believe that we're actually allied with Finland or Sweden, although we m- might be. There's yeah. such a weird tangle of alliances at this point that it's hard to say. Yeah. But, you know, why are we uh, talking about um, buying out these uh, Scandinavian companies instead of um, the American company? Or, or I'm sorry, not buying out, but... But propping up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is my guess on it, is that, uh, that they probably... I would think that they would have approached Qualcomm first, it yeah. being a U.S. company, um, if they're actually, like, doing anything to... to put this in motion to actually like make this play. And, and I don't know that they're actually, they are, but mm-hmm. I mean, maybe they are. I don't know. Yeah. Well, why would you put, um, why would you put Nokia and Ericsson first in your speech? Yeah. Is the question. I mean, I, I think that there would, that this would have to be a, uh, um, something that you had considered and maybe tried some other options and that this is what you were left with. Yeah. Like this was the next thing on the list. You're like crossing people off the list. My, and my guess is that it, Qualcomm and maybe Samsung, I, I don't have any reason specifically to believe that they would be um, higher on the list than Nokia or Ericsson. But I mean, I would think so, honestly. Like we already have fairly close ties with Samsung. I think the U.S. government does. But anyway, uh, my guess is that the U.S. government talked about this and these two companies, or at least Qualcomm, which because I have to assume that we would ask the U.S. company first if we were really discussing this. Yeah. Um, they said, yeah, we don't want you making decisions for us. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, Get uh, out of here with that. <laughs> we're happy to be a private company. We don't want to be a government-controlled company. Yeah. Um, and I could be wrong about that. Uh, but no, that would make nothing but sense. I mean, yeah. Otherwise, I just don't understand why the U.S. government would prop up a non-U.S. company when a U.S. company was an option. Well, and government money always comes with strings attached, and as a business, that may not be something you want to mm-hmm. deal with. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, well, I would certainly wouldn't want to deal no. with it. I mean, <laughs> doesn't you know it? Why own your company if you don't get to make the decisions? That's exactly. really the question, right? Um, and th- so there's lots of problems though with, with a government, uh, government supported a nationalized industry like this. If we take telecoms, yeah. um, as a nationalized industry and don't think for a moment, we push free enterprise here at, at this podcast, but don't think for a moment that the U S is a free enterprise system. <laughs> I mean, just think about your local utilities. 
Uh, that's fascism at work right there. And uh, so maybe we should just define these I was fixing right? to say, yeah, some definitions may help because we got in this conversation the other day. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, both uh, socialism and fascism um, include a state control of the economy. Right. So in socialism or communism, um, it's it's really kind of direct control of the state uh, over the economy. Yeah. Um, in fascism, it's state control of the economy through a proxy. Right. So the, the real difference between fascism and socialism or communism is who actually who technically owns these things. Um, it, it's essentially the difference is the titles of the people who benefit right. from the government monopoly. Yeah. Um, so in socialism, communism, it's, you know, technically they would say it's the people, it's the workers control it, but it's the government really. I mean, what it comes down to is it being state control because yeah. that's anything that's public is actually state control, well, right? Well, anytime you say that the people control it, the people are the gov. I mean, the government is the people. Like that's the same thing. Yeah, like, I presumably mean, that's well, the I mean, representation. That's yeah. the you know who actually well, exercises. I mean, people control. say people say we control the government, but believe me, <clears> like we don't control the the people of the U.S. Don't control the government. The government controls us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What's the Dave Smith's joke about? Um, uh, you know, when they're talking about the police, and he says, uh, yeah. "Well, they, you know." I, they they work for me like yeah well you go try and give them an <laughs> you go down to around. the precinct and try that one out <laughs> yeah um, so in in fascism though it's uh, it's private ownership but yeah. it's still government control okay so that's really the difference so the difference is that the titles of the people who actually get to benefit from the system in socialism or communism they're going to have state titles uh, they're going to be the minister of blah 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 or whatever. Um, and in, uh, in a fascist system, those people are going to be, um, you know, the CEO or whatever, but it's effectively the same thing. It's the people that are government connected, they benefit from the system and it's the government who actually controls the system. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's really the only difference. And, in this particular case, he talks about both things, you know, like I mentioned during the clip. Um, the idea that the U.S. government would purchase a controlling stake in these companies, that would be communist. Uh, although, I mean, it's kind of fascist in its own way. Oh, yeah, but we were talking about public utilities now, and yeah. I guess they're trying to treat this like a public utility, and I guess in some sense it is, but I don't approve of this idea with public utilities anyway. Well, um, here... I mean you have if where I live, there's one company that I can buy water from. Yeah. That's it. It's yeah, a, it's a government mandated monopoly. Yeah. Um, there is no competition and that, uh, that monopoly was handed to that company by uh, my local government. And there's always, anytime you start dealing with rate heights or anything like that, there's always a bunch of, it's, it's always a big problem. Like, because mm -hmm. the government controls it, you don't have another option. You have to get water from somewhere and, this is it. <laughs> yeah, and this is your only choice. Yeah. Unless you want to go down to the creek and <laughs> like right? gather up the water yourself, dig a well in your backyard. Yeah. Now, I'm lucky enough that when it rains a lot here, and it rains a lot a lot here, <laughs> yeah, um, I end up with a nice pond in my backyard. Yeah, go fishing out there. Yeah, just about. <laughs> um, you only catch frogs, I think, but Maybe still. some squirrels. Yeah, they don't do a lot of swimming. <laughs> They're they not can, in the water a lot. They can stay above. Yeah, they they stick to the trees. Yeah, but you've never been fishing with me, man. I end up in the trees more than I do in the water anyway. <laughs> I may come out with a squirrel. <laughs> that would be easy enough. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we, we already have some aspects of fascism here, uh, including, you know, who actually writes the legislation for these industries. It's the industry leaders that write the legislation. Uh, we've talked about more than once on this podcast how they write legislation to benefit themselves, to raise the barrier to entry, to prevent competition. Um, that's not a free enterprise system. Oh, no. It's already somewhat fascistic. Um, but this is just like openly um, – you know, socialist or fascist, what Barr is talking about, uh, through a consortium of private and Amer American and allied companies that they would, uh, you know, control these these two companies. And so here's... And, and it's all just to kind of stick it to China, too, which is another kind of wrinkle you have to add to that. You know, screw you, China. <laughs> UM Huawei. Yeah, I mean, that's the purpose. It's a weird concern. 
I had to go digging actually a little bit to find uh, about Qualcomm being a, an industry leader in this case. Oh, really? It's mostly foreign companies that are leading in 5G. Yeah. In in the infrastructure build out. Yeah. Now, of course, we've got AT and T and. Um, uh, down here locally, we've got C Spire, which is, I think, the largest privately controlled telecom company. Oh, really? Um, because all of them are, uh, yeah, all the others are corporate. It, it just means it's just like a single owner, like a, oh, okay. you know, not, um, not a big corporate entity. Yeah. But uh, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, like all these companies are involved in 5G, uh, but they're on the they're not on the build side, they're on the supply side. So they use somebody else's infrastructure to provide 5G services through their devices. Ah, I got you. They're not actually building out a 5G infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and that's where Huawei leads. And uh, Ericsson and Nokia are both um, pretty big into the radio frequency, like the actual wireless uh, portion of 5G. And uh, Qualcomm um, does more like hard point stuff, but they're still, yeah. you know, they're still there. And uh, I did get a little sidetracked. Um, so, you know, what, what's the problem with this anyway, right? It's that the government doesn't ever have to worry about profit. Like, and what that means, and I, and I know that the, you know, the socialists out there are going to tell me, well, the problem with uh, capitalism is that these companies are only concerned about making a buck for themselves and for their, um, their uh, shareholders, right? Yeah. But how do they do that? Yeah. They okay. provide the service. <laughs> yeah. And if they don't provide the service as well as somebody else, they have to outcompete for customers um, in, a, in a free market. Yeah. Uh, they have to outcompete other competitors for uh, customers. And the way they do that is by giving you what you want at the best price. Yep. Like providing the best service at the best price. That's how you gain customers. Yeah. The government doesn't have to worry about that at all. Just yeah. go to the DMV. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's just it. And the government's not particularly good at picking winners and losers either. Um, I mean, you can look back. I'm trying to think of some of the stuff during the Obama with the um, with the solar companies, mm -hmm. where they were investing all this money, and these places just kept going under every time they give them money. Yeah, well, I think that was just a racket, though. That it wasn't... may have been. I mean, I'm just saying. But there you go again with that you was know. just corruption. Uh, the government's actually really good at picking winners. Yeah. Because what they do is they prevent all competition. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that the company would be profitable. Yeah. And if the company loses, who do you think loses? Well, the the, the taxpayer loses. Yeah, of absolutely. Course, yeah. I mean, this is the, what we complain about with the bailouts and so forth. What they've done by deciding that some companies were too big to fail. And certainly if uh, the U.S. government had a controlling stake in a company, they would definitely consider that too big to <laughs> fail, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that if it profits, I, I can feel very confident that if the company profits, that that extra money isn't going back into the government system. The That uh, extra money, that profit is going to be privatized. Yeah. But if the company loses, um, then we're going to be stuck with the bill. The taxpayer will be stuck with the bill, yeah. uh, which is what happened with the bank bailouts as an example, yeah. is that these companies failed in some way. Now, they failed partly because of government regulation well, because but, the government forced them to make loans bad loans basically right um but that being said when it all came crashing down uh then we were stuck with the bill the taxpayer was stuck with the bill but in the meantime while there were profits and then after the bailouts when there were profits all that money just gets privatized so yeah. and we, we'd be looking at the same thing here and that's Certainly a problem with government involvement in the market. Uh, besides the fact that if you're concerned about the NSA, like we were talking about earlier, if you're concerned about the NSA listening in on your phone calls now, imagine if the U.S. government controls the infrastructure that all those signal signals are traveling on. Right, which is probably the reason this this was all brought up anyway. And by the way, uh, Barr is what the Attorney General or yeah. whatever. Like, why is he even discussing any of this? Anyway, because like, they're looking at it as a con as a security threat. A yeah. If a Chinese company controls that infrastructure and has access to those signals, yeah, yeah. So they're going to do the exact same thing we want to do. <laughs> right, right. It, it's again like the NSA is not dealing with any competition for who's going to spy on us. Yeah, exactly. You know. yeah. Um. So, but as long as we're on this, uh, I just wanted to to talk about the problems with socialism. I spent a little bit of time. 
um, today uh, kicking around on the Democratic Socialists of America website. Ooh. Yeah. Um, it was kind of interesting, actually, in some ways. Like, they're, I, I'm not entirely sure why they called themselves socialist at some point, because they were talking about that they didn't believe in a centrally planned market and and so on. Yeah. Um, that seems to me the, to be the defining feature of socialism, so I'm not... But this is democratic. It's different. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I- exactly. Because, obviously, the mass of people always knows what's best for them. Oh, yeah. That's, that's yeah. what we want. It's mob rule. Yeah. Um, so, the, I guess the first question was, why is it, or would be, um, why is it that uh, socialism or communist? I mean, we haven't really seen communist exactly, but uh, why is it that a socialist system always ends up being authoritarian? Um, and it, it is related to that centrally planned economy. Or if you want to do it as a democratically planned economy, either way, however you want to look at it, um, when the government lays down mandates about what's going to be produced and by whom and how much and so on and so forth, which is uh, almost a necessity if you're going to call it a socialist system, I think. Yeah. Um, and Or if you just think of it in terms of health care, uh, like that bit that Rand Paul said from long before, where if you mandate that I provide service to somebody um, and do it for free or at a particular price, uh, which may be less than profitable for me, like, haven't you then made me a slave? Yeah. But the the question and why it becomes authoritarian is because what if you say, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's where, yeah. And you have to, and the the overreaching government has to do something to prevent these things from happening mm-hmm. like to prevent you from saying no like i'm as a doctor i don't want to work on these certain people or whatever yeah yeah you know? this is not profitable for me in fact i lose money this way um yeah. why are you and here's the flip side of it and this is why it becomes a problem because yeah. if you start dividing up the work this way and again like connections get you everywhere right yeah. the, these these systems end up becoming terribly corrupt um, because, well, you know, the buddy of the guy who, who knows the minister that, uh, of whatever part of the economy this is, um, and they have dinner or they go to golf together or whatever. Um, well, he gets the choice stuff. So he, you know, they send the like really profitable kind of procedures to that doctor and this guy that doesn't know anybody or has, uh, you know, ticked off the minister or whatever. Um, they send him all the stuff that, that ha- that gives him no real value. Yeah. Um, and if you're planning an economy in this way, like you're dividing up the production, you're saying, all right, we need you to do these services. We need you to do these services, et cetera, well, et cetera. And it has to, even if it's not corrupt, it has to be divided up anyway. Mm-hmm. So there's no way to believe that even if you were honestly trying to be, to divide it up equally, that you would ever be able to do it anyway. To do it in a fair way. To do it in a fair way. Even yeah. if you honestly sat down and tried to do it, which wouldn't happen, by the way. But yeah. even to give the benefit of the doubt that you'd try, mm-hmm. you still wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, and it's ironic, too, right? Because that that's their big thing, especially the Demo- the DSA. Yeah. It's all about justice, you know, social justice, everybody being equal in the society and having the same things. Well, this you can't do it this way. Yeah. Um, and, and, in fact, uh, what ends up happening— The best way to do it is through the market. The market— sure knows how to divide these things up Mm -hmm. well the market doesn't know the market doesn't know anything but it Um, does it though (laughs) yeah uh and it it does it in a fairly effective way and there's a particular like variable i think that they're leaving out in their calculations that the austrians take you know um pay attention to uh that makes the difference um but what ends up happening is that the government is by necessity picking winners and losers, picking some people to do better than others um, in these systems, yeah. uh, just based on what they're being asked to do um, to provide for everybody. You know? yeah. And so what happens is that the, you know, the guy that's getting the terrible jobs, he's like, no, wait a minute. Like, this doesn't seem fair. You know what? I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. Well, then what happens to him? Like, you can't let him not do it. You yeah. can't let him make his own choices because you're trying to plan this whole thing for yourself, right? Yeah. Like, you're trying to organize all these moving parts. And if one guy's not doing his job, then, you know, the system breaks down. So yeah. that's how it becomes authoritarian. Like, you have to force this guy to do what it is that he's been asked to do. Yeah. 
he has to do now he has to do it out of fear instead of payment <laughs> right yeah right um it's more beneficial for him to make another choice uh in terms of economics well then you got to make it legally not beneficial yeah. right um and then uh you know that's kind of an example of why the central planning of anything always fails. And this is why you and I argue about immigration, um, (laughs) because it's a central planning system. You're trying to decide, you know, how many people you let in of what kind to fill these various uh, roles that they're coming in to fill, right? Well, you can't know. Uh, Like, there's no way. There's too too many things going on. And so the central planning fails and, and fails spectacularly um Mm -hmm. as owen benjamin always says this always ends in starvation and genocide yeah right um and democratic socialism you can vote your way into it but you got to shoot your way out right (laughs) Right. i mean that's the way it is like (laughs) yeah or you just wait wait for the whole thing to come crashing down right oh yeah um so the the issue of course is that there's too many variables like climate actually yeah. Right. Um, it, it's interesting that the, the, the two the things parallels that they, here. Yeah, the two <laughs> things that the Democrats most want to control right now are, are the um, economy and climate, and they're the two most complex systems that we deal with. There's just way too many variables, um, and it's uh, you remember Jurassic Park when they talk about chaos theory. You know, it's yeah. like a simplistic version that they go over there. I mean, but this is a real thing. This is a real mathematical phenomenon yeah. um, where in these highly like these very complex systems with tremendous numbers of variables that iterate on themselves, right? So um, when you talk about the iteration, uh, you're saying, okay, um, so you have this this huge function, we'll say, that, des- that describes the economy, this giant collection of equations yeah. um, that describes every aspect of the economy. And you give it an initial... Um, an initial input of variables like, all right, so we fill in all of these things, how much money's in the system, how many people are purchasing, you know, like if you could actually accurately measure all that stuff and you, yeah. and you put that into the function and then you play out the function. Well, yeah. what you do in an economy or in a climate or weather system or anything, what you do is you take the results of that and you take it back in and you, now they're the initial variables in the equation again. Right. And the function again. So you run it, you get results, you put those, you plug those back in, you run it again, you get the results, you take those results, you plug it back in, you run it again. This is how these things move on because they're all dependent on what happened before. Yeah. Well, you're doing that constantly. And after enough iterations, then like small differences in the initial inputs can yield really large differences in the final results. Yeah. All right. These are incredibly complex systems. And so what you see in centrally planned economies a lot is that they're trying to reduce variables. Yeah. All right, there's there's too much to keep track of. Let's reduce variables. And so you think about our system here where you go to a, a like, I get confused sometimes going to the store. If I'm just going to buy a, like deodorant yeah. or toothpaste, yeah. right? I've got 50 options in front of me and I'm like trying to read through and like figure out whether uh, am the, I more concerned. What's the best option for you, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Am I more concerned about my gums or am I more concerned about tartar or maybe I need some whitening and now you get these options where you have like it does six different things and I'm trying to figure out what those are, <laughs> right? So you have all these choices and it can be confusing, but that's that's a result of the market um, trying to play to everybody. Yeah. Like, uh, so you've got all of these companies that are competing for customers. Everybody's got their little niche thing, or every toothpaste company's got their little niche thing that they're mm-hmm. that they kind of provide for the market. You right, know? and somehow every single one of them, four out of five dentists agree that <laughs> that's the one for you. But. I, and obviously that mathematically can't be right. <laughs> There's some problems here. <laughs> but um, what ends up happening in these centrally planned economies is that you don't have all those choices. There's yeah. one toothpaste. Yeah, yeah. There you go. This it's, is your toothpaste. And it's called toothpaste. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> toothpaste. Um, it, maybe tooth cleaning solution or something. Who knows? Uh, but this is one way that they reduce variables. Yeah. Um, but of course, the biggest variable in any economy is and this is the thing that the Austrians take up that nobody else does. Yeah. This is the the part that the Austrian school recognizes that everybody else tries to ignore. And that's that the biggest variable in any economy is all of the individual people making their own choices. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? And they're not all rational choices. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, that's kind of what makes it fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like why do I buy Crest? 
I actually, I don't know that I buy Crest. But anyway. Uh, I, I use to, Aquafresh. I'll have to go look after this. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, why do I choose whichever toothpaste that I choose? Like part of it, it I mean, there's a bunch of ways, I suppose. But part of it is just like name recognition. Um, part of it is price. Uh, you know, part of it is how pretty the packaging is. I mean, packaging is important. You'd be surprised. I work in retail. Like that's important. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the point is that not all of these things make sense in me choosing the best toothpaste for myself. Yeah. Um, so people don't always act rationally, but, but that's kind of the thing, right? It's all of these individual choices that people are making that direct the market. Yeah, and you can't possibly account for all of that when you're trying to plan. Well, and the, this the same thing. Why, why in socialism, like you always end up with empty shelves and not enough stuff, or too much stuff, or whatever, because mm. you can't plan for that. Like the uh, the market knows because the market can can deduce. Well, if we got too much, the price will drop. Mm-hmm. Supply and demand. Right. You can't, but you can't engineer that. Like it, it just doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember hearing something, I can't remember the source now, that uh, that they actually said in the Soviet Union, well, at least we always have Switzerland, so that we know where to fix our prices. Yeah, right. like it, it has to be pinned to something, right? Yeah, I mean, so at least they, they're looking at a market system to try and figure out how much everything costs, because if you try and just assign a cost to it, that's why you end up with the the missing things. Yeah. Um, and the, the DSA guys, when they're talking about providing all of these things for free, uh, education, healthcare, all of these things. They're not free. None of this is free. Somebody's got to pay for it somewhere along the way. Yeah. And if you start fixing the price at a particular level, then you're going to end up messing up the market. You're going to end up with too much or too little because scarcity is just a reality of resources. Yeah. Like there's a limited n- amount of all of these things. Yeah. And you can't you can't possibly plan for how many people are going to want this specific thing or that specific thing. Yeah. And then there's always things that change, right? So maybe you've planned perfectly well how many oranges you need on the shelves to satisfy the demand across the country. Um, but then we have a, a late hurricane or an, er, or, or an early frost or something, and you lose part of that orange uh, production. Yeah. Well, now what? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> now we got a problem. Well, I think the biggest thing you can look at, though, is to take a look at where we have socialism in this country. Um, so I would use education, like high education, as the first example. Like, so what year did we start, like, with the government loans and stuff? It was like in the 70s or something, right? I mean, they started a while back. It became really serious, I think, in the 90s, yeah, um, late 90s, maybe, when the government just took over. Yeah. Uh, education loans yeah well and ever since then the price has done nothing but skyrocket mm-hmm. and and that's that's not an accident and it that's gonna happen oh it's an accident <laughs> well <laughs> well i mean it's it's a cause though there's, it's not a coincidence oh it's not a coincidence <laughs> there you go thank you michael but but that's kind of the point and you can look i mean um healthcare is the same way I mean, anytime you, anytime the government starts taking over these things, the prices of it just goes through the roof. I mean, and that's that's because you've socialized it. I mean, yeah. it's it's a symptom. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if we uh, so let's go a little de- little bit deeper on this. Um. So we we have to take Bernie Sanders seriously as a candidate, I guess now. Oh uh, yes, since we Since he do. since he won New Hampshire, um, and. Uh, we can stop taking Biden seriously as a candidate if we ever did, because he finished fifth now. Um, I'm telling you, the clock's ticking, man. Yeah, I think I said it on the last podcast. <laughs> it's a ticking, man. He's he's going. sticking through South Carolina at least. Yeah, but then he's gone. All right, so the let's talk about the two just briefly um, to try and uh, you know explain some of this, expound on this a little bit, right? Um, the two biggest socialist programs on Bernie's agenda are. Uh, and we'll start with number two. All right. <laughs> um, number two, one trillion dollars a year on a Green New Deal. Ooh. All right. I like green. Um, so the, you know, in this case, the government forces a rapid removal of carbon energy production. Um, the government funds, and remember, every time I say the government funds, that means the taxpayer, taxpayer funds. funds. Right? Absolutely. Um, the government funds uh, research and development for pollution-free energy sources, structures, Transportation technology, etc. Now, 
Um, the other thing he says is that this will create 20 million unionized jobs to make up for the losses when you destroy these other industries, right? <laughs> But here's one of the big problems with this. So then you're, you're kind of forced into price fixing. Yeah. Because the reason that green energy isn't a popular source of energy in this country is because it's way more expensive than the non-renewable sources. Yeah. Way more expensive. And it's actually like seriously subsidized. And it's still way more expensive. It's still more right? expensive, yeah. Right? Like if it was cheaper, people would choose it. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and maybe so, one day it will be, but it's not right now. So what happens with these things? You only have really two options. Like you have to price fix at a low enough level um, or poor people die. Yeah. Right. You create these 20 million unionized jobs. I I'm not entirely sure why it being unionized matters so much. Well, actually I do. It's because they want workers to control the economy yeah. because clearly workers have done a great job of predicting <laughs> what's needed for the future. That's why they're workers and not entrepreneurs. Right. <laughs> um. So that was sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, it was. They <laughs> can't see my face when I said that. Yeah. Um, so the you know these jobs aren't going to make up the difference, and like even with huge subsidies from the government, um, I can't imagine that these are higher paying jobs. And if they are higher paying jobs, then that means the energy is that much higher cost too. Yeah. Which means that once again, those people that are these laborers that are getting these jobs, their energy prices are still going up. Oh yeah. Um, so like the, the whole idea that, okay, well we can decide that this is how this is going to be done. Um, it, it just runs into a bunch of problems and how do you solve them as government? You got to do it by, by diktat. Yeah. Right. All right. So, it, and it doesn't, I don't, it, it even if, uh, let's just assume that climate change is a really serious problem and that we can actually do something about it. Yeah. All right. And that this is the answer. <laughs> all right. All right. Even if we assume all that, you've solved a problem and created a bunch more. Yep. Absolutely. A bunch more serious problems. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, maybe the that's the idea in the first place. Well, if we, you know, because this may be partly why socialism ends in uh, in genocide is yeah. because, well, you know, the, those human variables, we got to get rid of some of them. <laughs> we got to get rid of some of those, right? <laughs> oh, that's good. So, okay, well, let's take the next one then, right? Unless you have something more to say about the Green New no, Deal. No, I don't. I don't know how it's still getting so warm in this room. Like, it's, an, it's a yeah. nice, cool day. Yeah, anyway. I'm sweating. Um, so the, the biggest one is, of course, the three and a quarter, roughly trillion dollars a year. That's the t -t -t trillion dollars a year um, for the Medicare for all plan. Ah, okay. All right. So, uh, you know, I keep reading about this because I'm just not sure like where the numbers are coming from. And I think once again, well, all right. Let's, so there are some analyses that suggest I keep getting ahead of myself because I know what I have to say, <laughs> yeah. but you don't. <laughs> so let's, let's try and explain it and then start asking the questions. Um, so there are some analyses that suggest that a single payer, uh, government healthcare system would cover more people at a higher level of coverage for the same cost as the nation currently spends on healthcare. And I even came across this article where they're quoting this guy, um, Charles Blahaus. I I'm not sure how necessarily to say that name, which the, uh, the author of the article describes as of the libertarian Mercatus center at George Mason university. Right. That found that the single payer health care for all Americans um, would cost at least thirty two and a half trillion dollars during the first decade or about three point three trillion dollars per year. And then we have this quote from Charles Blahaus. Blaus. Blaus. Blahaus. Blahaus. Blahus. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, he says, I'm scoring the federal cost here and it's enormous. Uh, the other side of the coin is businesses, individuals, states, and others are not going to be paying these costs. They're going to be given to the federal government. Now, does that sound like the statement of a libertarian? I first was fixing off? to say, this, what kind of libertarian is this guy? Yeah. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> the it's government's going to pay. pay for it. It's not the businesses <laughs> and the people. Where do you think the government's money comes from? It comes right. from us. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> then I had to do a little research into the Mercatus Center, uh, oh, yeah. after this, cause I was like, well, this doesn't seem right. What do you mean? Libertarian Center? Like, who the hell is this guy? We're not inviting him to the next <laughs> convention, right? No, no, definitely not. <laughs> um, so it, the Mercatus Center, I, I don't know where the author got 
the idea, actually. The Mercatus Center doesn't actually identify itself as libertarian. Um, and in Clearly. fact, on, on their website, they say, uh, Mercatus scholars conduct their own research regarding which institutions, markets, governments, nonprofits, or combinations of the three promote the best social outcomes. Oh, okay. In fact, the only thing libertarian that I could, even like remotely libertarian that I could find about it, um, was that they do draw from uh, Friedrich Hayek. Okay. Who, yeah, um, wrote I'm, the, uh, what's it called? The Road to Serfdom? Yeah, I think so. Is that the right title? It was a great book, by the way. I do recommend it. Um, and, you know, he kind of falls into the Austrian camp somewhat. He's on the fringes, though, anyway. Yeah. Like, it's not like they're they're quoting a bunch of Mises stuff or anything. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, but, all right, let's address this. What I think they're missing, again, is the the human choices, right? Like the actual individuals that are making decisions about their health care in this. So they say that uh, if we provide all these services for free, um, for free, put that in quotes, <laughs> quotes. Um, that, uh, you know, that we would end up spending as a nation less or approximately the same as what we're spending right now. Yeah, but then you're just assuming that everybody's going to keep doing exactly what they're doing now. And exactly. guess what? They're not going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I have a cold right now and I know that it costs me $50 to go to the doctor to have them tell me like, yeah, you got a cold. Um, you got to let it run its course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what they always tell me. <laughs> Pretty it's much. a viral infection. You got to let it run its course. I mean, there are some antivirals, but they're expensive too, right? So, yeah. uh, but let's say that right now I get that cold and I'm just like, I know it's cold. Or maybe I'm a little concerned that it's the flu and maybe, you know, as I'm starting to feel the temperature rise and, and not feeling right, like I'm, I'm a little concerned it's the flu. So I consider what are the possibilities that it's the flu and I, I kind of um, put that up against the cost of me going to the doctor to find out. Yeah. Because if I find out it's the flu, maybe they can give me a little something that'll, you know, that'll give me tam flu or something it, yeah. um, that'll prevent it from getting worse or whatever. Yeah. Right? And I'm thinking, well, 50 bucks could just be a cold. It's probably just a cold. I haven't been exposed to anybody with the flu. You know what? I'm going to sit home and I'm just going to see like how I'm this goes. I'm going to wipe this thing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be fine. I mean, I don't feel that terrible right now. Yeah. All right. But now let's do that whole scenario again if my doctor's visit is free. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely going to the doctor. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> only problem with that is, so is you and everybody else. You ain't right. getting into that doctor because it's going to be so packed. It's going to be like the ERs right now. <laughs> yeah, and nobody's going to want to be a doctor in that system anyway because you can't make any money. Yeah. I mean, why in the world would you want to go to 10 years of school and go, uh, well, I mean, it used to be $100,000 in debt. I have no idea how far oh, dude, in debt you are by the time you finish no grad school telling. now. Of course, I guess you don't have to worry about that in the system, right? Cause because that's free, free too, too, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. So you you have a shortage of doctors in the system because why would you become a doctor um, when you could become a lawyer and then just like prosecute healthcare fraud or whatever uh, and make more money that way? Exactly. In, in the private, you know, in the in the private enterprise. In what's still private? Yeah, because <laughs> lawyers are always going to be well, obviously, private enterprise. Yeah. So, um, you know, once again, you run into this problem of like, you're not, you're not adjusting for how people are going to react to their lower costs. It's like you completely ignore the rules. And yeah, I said rules of supply and demand and price. Yeah. yeah Cause yeah. Cause price affects these things. Price right. is affected by these things and price affects these things. Yep. Absolutely. All right. That's probably enough of that. <laughs> we've been on quite the rant. I feel yeah. like <laughs> we, we've bashed socialism long enough. Yeah. Um, so we we wanted to play and talk about Bloomberg, right? Yeah, we only barely talked about him last time, just a little bit. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't even remember how much we said. Um, I do want to point out uh, that um, I I play uh, this tabletop RPG from time to time. Yeah, and um, one of the groups that we did uh, was set in New York City. It's like a modern day um, thing, and it is set in New York City. And so I, like, me in character in New York City, like, talk trash about Michael Bloomberg constantly. Because yeah. why then, not, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know. And then something came up uh, in game um, about, uh, like, assassinating Bloomberg. This <laughs> is a game, everyone. A game. All right. 
Um, and uh, so in character, once again, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll take that job. I'd do that for free. <laughs> I'd do that for free, right? <laughs> right? And so after the session, um, the, the storyteller said, like, what is your deal with Bloomberg? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I explained to him, like, this guy has absolutely no regard for personal liberties, um, oh. for the rights of people in any way. Uh, he thinks that it is his responsibility, I think, um, to do everything he can to protect you in every way he can, which is being done apparently like the um, uh, iRobot in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> um, not in the book. The book was a little different. But yeah. uh, in the movie, you know, this idea, well, the best way to protect you is to take away all choices from you because yep. obviously you can't be because trusted to make the right you one. You can't right? make any right choices. And that actually feeds right into this incredible arrogance that we're going to see in the opening statement by this guy. So here we go. All right. If you think about it, we, the intelligentsia, people who could make it into this room, um, we believe in a lot of things in terms of equality and protecting individual rights that make no sense to the vast bulk of people. All right. How do you like that intro? The intelligentsia like us, you know, people who could make it into this room. I, unreal. Like, <laughs> and of yeah. course, you know. All, all us plebs, we don't care about protecting individual rights. Like you and me, of course, right? <laughs> right. We don't, we don't care about this stuff. Yeah. Um, but there you go. Just, uh, just a little example of the the arrogance um, of some of these people. I'm not going to apply it to everybody, but uh, Bloomberg the, definitely yeah, qualifies. The shoe fits on Bloomberg. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's go into the next bit of the clip. They're not opposed to you having some rights, but there's a fundamental disconnect between us believing the rights of the individual come first and the general belief around the world, I think it's fair to say, that the rights of society comes first. And so um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, uh, the bathroom issue in, in, in the United States. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you want to know, is somebody a good salesman? Give them the job of going to the Midwest and picking a town and selling to that town the concept that some man wearing a dress should be in the locker room with their daughter. If you can sell that, you can sell anything. Okay. <laughs> so he, right. And people laugh like they know how, it, how this makes sense. <laughs> right. <laughs> that somehow it makes sense to everybody in that room, apparently. Um, that, uh, the, that the idea of a man wearing a dress should be in the locker room with uh, some guy's daughter, um, that seems perfectly reasonable. <laughs> to them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, everybody in the room understands how that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's keep going with this. I mean, they just look at you and they say, what on earth are you talking about? And you say, well, this person identifies his or her gender as different than what's on their birth certificate. And they say, what, what do you mean? You're either born this or you're, or you're born that. And they say, what do you mean? You're either born this or you're born that. Because that doesn't make sense, of course. <laughs> like, that, that statement doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, now, look, I'm, I hate to point this out to everybody. But you either have a Y chromosome or you don't. <laughs> There's no in between. <laughs> you you really are born this or that. Yeah, but I believe. <laughs> Gender is a binary. Oh, yeah. Whether you want to believe it or not. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it's true. You either have a Y chromosome or you don't. Now who's the authoritarian? <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that people can't identify themselves however they choose. I'm just saying the biological reality of the situation is different. Fair enough. All right. Um, okay. So moving on, because this is how he I explains all this away and, and tells us how there are some situations where that kind of uh, gender binary does make sense. Okay. Right? Um, and, you know, I will say in our prison system in New York City, we have to have the policy when you walk in. You know, drop your trousers, you go this way, you go that way. That's it, because you can't sit there and you can't mix things in a jail. That's a practical case of where you have to make a decision. Okay, yeah, so uh, you don't mix things uh, in jail, but obviously, though, there's no danger in mixing things in a high school locker room, yeah. right? 
I think you got that backwards, buddy, <laughs> or something. I don't know. Yeah. Like, that's just, just to, to think that it would be okay in one and not the other is just insanity. Right. Yeah, you go this way, you go that way doesn't make sense at the in high school. Yeah. Uh, only in prison. Only in prison, right. <laughs> and actually, they're starting to question that, right? <laughs> oh, really? Like, this is from 20, I don't remember, 2012, 2016. I can't remember I think when this it, I think this called. is 2016, yeah. yeah. It wasn't that long ago. All right. Well, we've only we've only got a little bit left, so we'll just go ahead and finish it off. All right. But it's so many things that we are nuanced, and um, the issue, the social issues that we're very proud of uh, of achieving, aren't believing aren't believed by the vast bulk of the people. All right. So here's the thing, and, and this is back to that arrogance, that last little bit of the clip. But um, you know the they understand the nuance of all these issues and the rest of us don't. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I think on this whole thing, like he's just, he's got it backwards. Um, he's talking about ignoring the individual rights. If we take his example of the locker room, right. Um, he's talking about ignoring all the individual rights of the girls in the locker room and all of their parents, uh, rights and responsibilities to protect their children, um, in favor of, a you know, we'll just say a trans person's, um, individual rights. But the reason that their rights are more important than all these other people's rights is because of their membership in this specific group. Yeah. So how is it that he's saying that, it, you know, the societal rights that everybody else thinks that the societal rights are more important than the individual's rights? Well, he's ignoring a whole bunch of people's individual rights for one person's individual rights because of where they fit in the society. Right? Am I am I misreading? That? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, that's how I understand it. I mean, you know, and if that's not the case, if it's not because of their membership in this specific group of trans people, um, then why not let any guy into the girls' locker room? Because it, you know, it's discriminatory to prohibit them from entry just because it's a it's a boy, <laughs> uh, or um, he has the right to travel unimpeded, does he not? That's a right. Why are we ignoring that right in this case? <laughs> or better yet, why have gendered locker rooms at all? We can do it like Starship Troopers, right? Everybody can share the same shower room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and everybody should be fine with that because these are all nuanced issues. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, like I, I heard this clip and I was like, I can't believe Lord, this guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, if if there, if you have any doubt that Bloomberg's not a tyrant, all you have to look at is so you can look at all of the stuff that he tries to take away and tries to regulate. But what you really should look at is what's in the media right now, and that's the stop and frisk policy that he embraced in New York, and. I mean, that tells you everything you need to know. The whole idea that a cop can stop you and frisk you for no reason at all, just for walking down the street. And, and for anybody that would embrace a policy like that, that's a tyrant. But Liberty Larry, it was effective. Well, maybe. It reduced crime. Maybe it did, but that's not something I care about. I don't care about that type of crime. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I'm just saying, like, because, I mean, what were they stopping people for? Like, weed and crap? <laughs> well, I mean, they were stopping people for anything, but, the like, it, firearms obviously yeah. got people put in jail, too. Yeah. I mean... It, well, see, I'm not for having to have a license to carry a firearm, so, well, I, you know? <laughs> I agree, but, I mean, the... the the fact is that the results would suggest that this was an effective prob uh, then an my, effective policy at preventing crime, including violent crime. Then, then my question is, why is he running away from it now? Because he is running from stop and frisk like it is nobody's is business. He? Oh, yes, I he know. is. Oh, he's running away from this like the plague, man. Yeah. <laughs> so if it was so effective, why ain't he standing behind it? Well, because it's a clear violation of personal liberty. It's it's a it's and a it openly was aimed, authoritarian. And it was aimed at a specific group of people. At least that's like how a racial it, minority is that what they're That's yeah. well, it, it, well I'm pretty sure. I mean, I don't know cuz I don't live in New York, but I'm pretty sure like that's the way it was implemented. That may mm. not have been the way it had been planned to be implemented, but yeah. that's what happened. So I could make some comment about that. Too. I'm just going <laughs> to skip it this time. Um wow. Because you can't so, see my face and you can't tell that I'm joking. Being facetious. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, the the problem with that is again, it's a complete um, 
disregard for people's individual liberties. Yeah. Um, that you have the, I mean, it's just, it's just openly authoritarian. Yeah. It's just openly authoritarian that the idea that any of these law enforcement personnel can stop you at any time for any reason and, and search you and search your part. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, um, is, uh, just like a total violation of, I, I would say like, you know, the fourth amendment. Easy. And if they and if they take something away from you, then it's a violation of the Fifth Amendment too, right? <laughs> um, because they're you know the government isn't supposed to be able to take your property uh, without due process of law. Yeah. This is not and and That's they mean, exactly what happens. Yeah, yeah, they mean court by that by the way, <laughs> oh, like yeah. found guilty in court. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, with uh, 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 you know, in front of your peers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and, and of course the Fourth Amendment. And I, I've heard people make the argument. Like, because we talk about emails, right? In terms of the Fourth Amendment, yeah, that you shouldn't, they shouldn't be able to search your emails. Um, it's, uh, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's, uh, um, uh, property, papers, and effects, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and obviously the 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 purpose is to prevent the government from going through your private belongings and going through your thoughts. Uh, like if you're talking about notes or a letter or, or that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, without, again, without uh, due process of law, without a uh, warrant that's very specific about what it's looking for, where it expects to find it, who's involved and who's making the claim. Yeah. All right. And uh, all these things are just being thrown out in, uh, stop and frisk. Um, this, that kind of activity, stop and frisk, is the reason that we launched a revolution against the against Great Britain two hundred yeah. years ago. No joke of this. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, the only thing that we we've been relatively secure in so far, if, as far as I know, is the the Third Amendment stuff about uh, quartering soldiers. Like we hadn't had to deal with that, <laughs> but that's only because the government owns so much property in this country oh, yeah. um, that they don't need to use our houses. They have got plenty of their own. Yeah, right. You know? oh. So I, that's probably as good a place as any to stop, I suppose. Um, we're we're pushing up against it, especially once we stick the clips in. Oh yeah. So uh, we we may as well call it. Um, and uh, tomorrow's Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Uh, remember, we were taught about fifty years ago: um, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, you know that song. Uh, maybe. And uh, and of course, uh, we'll be back in about a week. Um, in the meantime, follow us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe on iTunes and Podbean, like and share, tell your friends. Um, I don't know. Is that everything? I think that's pretty well it. Uh, website's thelibertymike.com. You can see uh, links to my more recent writing that's been published elsewhere and um, my older writing that was published there. Uh, it's supposed to be a blog, but it turns into an essay collection. <laughs> yeah, well. So sorry about that, everyone. Um, you know, I, I should start adding uh, too long didn't reads to all my articles, <laughs> just a summary uh, paragraph or something. Um, and uh, like I said, we'll be back in about a week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, uh, avoid Bloomberg and try and stay free. <laughs> Train how you fight. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.